All right, so we're back to the review on uh, on reclaiming natural manhood, and we are now on point seven. And if you haven't seen the other ones, uh, go try to find the video that's before this. And let's see. So we are on point seven, which is the essay called. Did I leave that page off? Science as an institution of man's oppression. And again, uh, as before, I'm going to put, put all the links here, but just to make it easier, that's what the title is, Science as an Institution of Man's Oppression. And he starts talking about Darwin, uh, Charles Darwin, the guy who first, thought, uh, who first discovered uh, evolution. And he makes the point that because Darwinism focuses solely on sexual reproduction to the, exclusive, uh, to the exclusion of non-sexual or non-reproductive sex, that this is actually uh, playing into the heterosexualization and exclusive heterosexuality of culture, because it makes all sorts of no, uh, all sorts of non-procreative sex look like uh, biologically sick, abnormal, and unhealthy. Now, uh, now a, a couple of interesting things about Darwin. Darwin himself never had a biology degree, but he did have a degree. He had a degree in divinity, so he was a theologian. Okay, um, I guess maybe they didn't have biology degrees in those days. But the point is, uh, he was he was not only a, a theologian, but he also um, absorbed the Victorian era's moralities. Okay, so the Victorian era, they did, certainly didn't like sex between men. They they didn't like well, I guess they didn't like sex openly very much, anyways. But they focused on procreative sex because of their Christian upbringing. And it's not a surprise then that when Darwin's coming up with evolution, the only thing he's looking at with evolution is procreative sex. Now you might say, well, wait a second, uh, but that's what evolution is about. If you don't have sex, uh, if a male doesn't have sex with a female, you, uh, you, don't have, you don't have evolution. You don't have genes passed on, so what's going on? Well, you know, the interesting thing is you don't, there are a lot of, as I've said, exclusive non-sexual and non-reproductive sexual activities that do influence evolution. Okay, so it's not that evolution is wrong, but why are we only focusing on male-female sex? For example, uh, the species bonobos. Uh, bonobos are notoriously bisexual. Okay, notoriously. And the question is, it, if it's only about males, females having sex, why is bisexuality so predominant among bonobos? And again, that's not made up. That's just what, what it is. So if bonobos are having sex, it must serve some evolutionary purpose. And, and, and the purpose that it serves is that uh, there's less tensions in the group. Okay. So if all, everybody's having sex and that's how they resolve their problem instead of killing each other, then that can actually help the, the actual instance of male-female sex because there's more males and females left over. So that's a, a survival strategy. So you don't need to... So, so the point is you cannot ignore non-sexual and non-procreative activities and say, well, that has nothing to do with sexuality because it could, okay, indirectly. Okay. Okay, let's see. So the point is, is Darwin was influenced by religion and the Christian religion only focused on procreation, so it's not a surprise that early evolution and Darwinism only focused on, on the, the instance of male-female sex and ignored everything else. But it's an interesting point, nonetheless, to say that Darwin himself was influenced by religion, uh, which is kind of ironic because nowadays evolution is completely considered atheistic and and, you know, even the people who are religious who believe in, in evolution are going to say, well, you know, God was before that, but God is not directing evolution, so to speak. That's just a natural process. Okay, so point number eight. Okay, so point number eight has a lot to do, it's a follow-up on, on the evolution Darwin question, and it touches on chapter 10. Okay, so let me let me just read a couple of paragraphs here and comment on it. Um, so when science used transgendered males who liked men, who were never considered men in any human societies in the past, as the representatives of men who liked men, no man had the voice or courage to challenge it. And thus science coined for the first time the concept of homosexuality, which, which mischievously mixed male transgenderism with male sexual need for men. As the feminine gendered males who, like men, throng the homosexual space and claim to be the only representative of men's sexual need for men, and as the male sexual need for men officially became their property, 
to the exclusion of other men, men distance themselves from this stigmatized group by defining themselves as heterosexual and disowning completely their sexual need for men. Now, this might sound weird, but if you read chapter 10, you kind of might know what I'm talking about. So in chapter 10, I make the case that homosexuality, the word itself, is a conflation. So what happened before uh, the Christians took over the Roman Empire, you had many different kinds of sex between males. You had masculine on masculine sex. You had males having sex with feminine males. You had more or less feminine males, uh, maybe like the kind of gays that we have today. The point is you had many different varieties of men having sex. When Christianity came along, they said, fuck all this, we don't care. Two men having sex, doesn't matter how they're doing it, doesn't matter what their gender is, doesn't matter if one's masculine, the other one's effeminate, doesn't matter if they're transgendered. Every instance of men having sex with men, whatever position, it's absolutely wrong. So what they did, so then what happened is when the 1800s come around, and then we find this category called the homosexual, the only the only thing the homosexual category refers to is the subtype of more or less effeminate males who want to have sex with other men. It does not refer to masculine men who have sex with other masculine men or masculine men ha who have sex with feminine men, okay? So basically, uh, what he's talking about is chapter 10, the conflation of different kinds of sexuality between males conflated into one little category that excludes all the rest. Now, when masculine men have uh, sex with other masculine men, science would then say, oh, well, the evidence for that, well, even if we can find it, it's just situational homosexuality. And we make up those sort of excuses that we've talked about. Uh, situational homosexuality would be chapter 7. So that's what he's saying here, is that you have many different varieties, and then, like a funnel, it just becomes one at the end, and we ignore the nuances and varieties that were beforehand, okay? I hope I didn't forget any. Oh, uh, by the way, I think for point, uh, the, the ones about bonobos and all this stuff, the book that he references and the book that I reference is called this. It's called Biological Exuberance. Uh, Animal Homosexuality and Natural Diversity by Bruce uh, Bagamil, uh, Ph.D. Uh, this is a very nice book. Uh, it, it also looks at the bias, bias that scientists had when studying animals. So, so like 100 years ago, uh, you, you had these zoologists who would look at animals and say, oh, well, this animal is, is fornicating in unnatural ways with other males. And it's like, how can, you, how can animals be unnatural? You know, so they brought their bias and had no self-awareness. Uh, it also has a bestiary which uh, profiles specific species. So it's a two-part book. It's a very good book. Uh, if you want to buy a book, this is the a book to buy on animal sexuality and, uh, well, specifically animal homosexuality. Although, again, homosexuality is a conflated concept and we shouldn't be using it. But the point is, let's move on to point number nine. Uh, point number nine is basically seven reasons why homosexuality is an invalid concept. So this is just a, a summation and a rehashing of all the points that we just talked about in point number eight. Um, so, you know, you might want to read that. And again, I'm linking to all this, so just it's easier for you to find if I read off the headline. The last point, and it, he makes a very interesting last point here. Or, well, rather, he, he makes a couple other points after it, but it's the last point that I want to talk about is whereas Guerrero makes the point that most males have a bisexual potential, this guy actually goes out of the way to claim that for the majority, approximately 85% of males, the primary sexual need in this group is towards other males. So he goes, he says most men in a non-homophobic, non-heterosexualized society, most men would be with most men most of the time, okay? And he says that only a, for a minority, approximately 15% of males, the primary sexual needs is towards women. And he, and he would say that this is the feminine gendered and metrosexual males would be part of this category. Um, now, what is the evidence that he says? Well, what he brings up is that in a lot of mammalian species, the actual sex between the male and the female is very short and it doesn't really happen very often. Now, as an analogy, if you look at gorillas, and from this book, you find out that gorillas have sex. They, they have sex with females, but the, the way their societies are set up is you have an, uh, a kind of an alpha gorilla, and he has a harem 
of many females. As a result, you have a lot of males who don't have female partners. So those male gorillas without female partners, they band together and they basically have sex with each other. So you have entire little tribes of male gorillas that are having sex with other male gorillas for most of their lives. Now they might wander off and have sex with a female accidentally or something, I don't know. But the point is they spend most of their time having sex with other uh, other males. So it's certainly a possibility and it's a very interesting way of looking at it that society not only takes away male desires, male on male desires from most males, but that in fact you could have most males who would spend most of their time with other males, okay, including in a sexual capacity. That is really weird, isn't it? Now I would say that eh, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It could be true. Um, I would say that this places the burden of proof on a very, um, the burden of proof is really shifted this way. So I, I'm much more comfortable with just saying most men have a bisexual potential because that's a lot easier uh, to prove. But again, it's, it's very interesting to look at it this way and say, um, and say that most men could have sex with other men as a primary sexual outlet. That is, that is fascinating. And I think, hold on. Do I have anything else here? I think that was pretty much it. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly... Right, I mean, th there's certainly a bit more in this book, and I just wanted to do the major points, uh, the major overlaps with Guerrero. Uh, I, I certainly neglected a couple things here in this review, but that's the whole point of a review, is if anything in here is interesting, read it, and then maybe you'll discover some other things that weren't talked about here. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions as usual, you can ask on the forum, YouTube, or wherever else. Thank you very much.